All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I would love for this to be uh, a, a true Q&A session, so I'm not going to necessarily call on anybody, but I got on the line, I got a D Strout, I got Roof, I got David, I got Kevin. Is there anything specific that you guys would like to have answered or things that I can uh, get you started off with? Mike. Hey, what's up, man? Can I just jump in on the voice? Is that okay? Uh, I would love that. Go right ahead. Okay. So I'm there. This is my first time hopping on here with you. Oh, very cool. Um, very cool. I don't, uh, I don't know how this whole format runs. I don't know if I missed something before this. No, we literally I, just, just got started, man. So cool. Yeah. No. So I just got the email. I just signed up for the university. Um, I guess, you know, I don't have like a ton of questions, but something that uh, I struggle with um, a little bit is driving that, say that uh, repetitive sprint ability, that adaptation yep. in an athlete who is already playing another sport. Yeah. Balancing that, what's too much, what's not enough. Yeah. Uh, that's a big one. Yep. So let's start with that, okay? Because I think, you know, one of the big things, and you're absolutely right, it's hard to layer more conditioning on top when they're already conditioning for their sport, right? Or, or actively participating in their sport. So one of the, the big things that I will kind of coach my coaches about, and sometimes that's IFAST, sometimes that's other people that I'm like mentoring, um, but you can always chase the power end of the spectrum, right? So think, let's say it's a soccer player or a basketball player. You can still do like short, like five second burst exercises, right? Like think a lactic power. So like five seconds on 90 seconds off. And, you know, it could be a sled sprint. It could be a kettlebell jump. It could be a prowler push and then working on full recovery. So you're not necessarily chasing the conditioning side of the equation as much as you're chasing the output side. Okay. So think about like the analogy that, that always goes over well is like, if we're talking about lifting, right? Like who's going to have better endurance with a 225 bench test, the guy that can bench 240 or the guy that can bench 300, right? Like the guy, the guy that can bench 300, right? Cause he's got more output to deal with. So anything underneath that, is at a lower threshold to him. It's less stressful to his system. So that's kind of the approach that I would take. Um, or just keeping it, even if it's not true alactic power, where it's like five on, 90 off, maybe it's in that one to eight, one to 10 work to rest. So it's very alactic aerobic. I still think you can see some really positive adaptations there because you're still, you're still training the power into the spectrum. You're still forcing their aerobic system to kind of, I always think of it as, it's like, uh, it's like when you've got a window open in the background of your computer, right? And it's operating, you don't really know it's there. Like that's what your aerobic system's doing to replenish, you know, the energy stores so that you can be anaerobic when you need to, right? Or alactic. So that's kind of the way that I would think about it. And that's one of the things that I'll have people do because look, unfortunately, not a lot of coaches understand the physiology side of this. So they're just smashing these kids with conditioning or their practices aren't, aren't set up very well. So that's something that we can always do, I think, to infuse some good stuff um, in between. You know, the other option is, and this is more dependent upon how often they're training, but like, let's say they're participating in their sport like three days a week. Maybe something else that we can do on the back end is just like more general aerobic conditioning. So we could do stuff like tempo running and that sort of thing on the off days. So like very Charlie Francis type level stuff, 70 to 75%, nice fluid runs, opening the legs up, um, you know, like a one to four, one to five work to rest ratio, but it's not intensive enough to where you need that extended rest. Um, I think stuff like that can work really well too. But, so you're not, yeah, that's cause I mean, I, I mean, I, you're, so you like wouldn't be worried about the, um, 
just the volume if you're running some of those tempo sprints that's not that's like the intensity is low enough where it's not gonna matter yeah yeah and that's the key right like that's what charlie always kind of harped on is we spend too much time in the middle so either go really hard or kind of make it fluid and relaxed so it is easy and it's almost more restorative than it is taxing on the system so if you're talking driving say like you said power drive the yep. power end of the spectrum five on yep. 90 off yep. would you would you structure like that sort of session similar to like say like intensity sprints so rest as needed um, yeah yeah oh for sure for sure yeah yeah right. yep. because the goal there is power right right right, so right if it's somebody that's super fit they may only need 50 to 60 seconds and their heart rate is back where it needs to be but like a big o or d lineman it may be 90 seconds to two minutes, right? And then from there, then all you're doing is as they get more and more fit, then you can start chopping into that rest as you go. I mean, that's, like, that's exactly what I'm doing. So I've got like uh, this D lineman I'm working with right now. And that's the exact kind of thing we started with. We started with very pure alactic power type stuff. And now as he's getting closer and closer to the season, we're just eating into that rest period, but trying to keep the power as high as we can. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Dude, you are rocking that beard, man. You're ready. You're ready for November and it's not even here yet. Oh, oh you can. <laughs> Wait, how do you get it? How'd it go? You're going to get it, huh? How'd it go? I don't have time to do that. <laughs> oh. All right, what else, guys or gals? Okay. What else can I answer? Or, David, you had more questions, right? I got there at 10. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Uh, let me give me a moment. Let me see if I can recall it. I kind of lost it in that conversation. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you think of it, just jot it down, okay? Who else has stuff? What else can I answer? Kevin, Rufus, you guys got anything? Hi, Mike. Hey, what's up, man? How are you? All right, I'm doing great. Uh, question I have is uh, working with uh, young kids, uh, middle school, who've yep. never, never really uh, been on extensive uh, training program before. How do you initially get them uh, conditioned to the point where they feel comfortable going uh, to into uh, the practice? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think. A big part of this, at least for me, is how you set up the training session in and of itself. Like I don't worry about it a ton, maybe for the first two to three months, I almost use the training session and the pace that we work through the training session as, I think of that as like GPP, right? Uh huh. You're, you're literally just trying to build a base for them. So, you know, as long as they're not taking too long in between rest, that sort of thing, if you're slowly just building, building the general physical preparedness in the, the training session itself and keeping the pace up throughout that, as long as you're covering all the bases, you're doing some speed and power work, some strength work, some conditioning work. What you tend to find is they're like a thousand percent more prepared than their peers when they show up on day one. So I don't, I don't, I don't think I do a ton of external conditioning. Um, and part of that is bias, right? Because the two sports that I work with the most are basketball and soccer. And I feel like they get a lot of conditioning just from playing their sport. You know, it's, and, and keep in mind, I don't love that. I wish I had more control over it, say in the off season, but a lot of these kids play year round. So they're in relatively good shape. So I just try and continue to build like the movement skill and the movement quality and the strength and the power development in the gym, you know? And then I think if you're keeping the, the pace of the workout up, you're going to get the conditioning that you want kind of as a byproduct of that. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, another uh, consideration is that it seems like now uh, so many of the kids uh, seem to be uh, inflexible, uh, don't have great mobility. Should yes. uh, an extensive period of time be spent on trying to develop mobility and, and uh, flexibility with these kids? Or uh, oh, I, ab I absolutely think so. And I think, you know, there's a lot of different times in the workout when you can do this. I think you're, if you're going to let them foam roll, and do their resets, that's a big part of it, trying to get them in the right position. Um, we're always gonna take, I would say the first 10 to 15 minutes of our athletic development classes are gonna be built towards, you know, those, not just flexibility and mobility, but like 
rhythm, coordination, you know, a lot of these like skills that I don't want to like sound negative, but you know, a lot of these kids just frankly don't get anymore. They're not getting it in gym class and that sort of thing. So we kind of use that as a time to build some of those skills like skipping, you know, just the coordination and the rhythm that they don't have, but absolutely. So we're going to work on it there in like the, the resets and the readiness portion. We're also going to do it at the end too. Like maybe if it's three to five minutes, maybe we'll do some cool down breathing, but you know, I'm not opposed to doing some hip flexor stretching, that sort of thing, post-workout, try and loosen them back up a little bit. I think there's definitely benefit there, but you know, at the end of the day, like that's the starting point, right? If a kid doesn't have just the, the requisite mobility and stability to do the stuff that we need, then we've got to build that first because otherwise we're just building this, this really big, robust engine on a really shoddy frame. All right, thanks. Of course. What else, guys? What other questions can I answer? I got a couple questions. Yeah, let's go, man. When you, so like if I'm, um, if I'm running a, a, oh man, how do I want to say this? So when I'm working with an athlete, like I typically structure, uh, if I'm running intensity sprints, I structure that before strength work. If I'm doing any tempo or volume, I do it after. Yep. Would you put, I mean, would that how you, I mean, how would you structure, uh, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how deep you can go on this, but like day to day, week to week, and then like month to month across the cycle, like what, what would that increase in intensity and sort of, uh, 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 um, cons- uh, shit, what do I want to say, uh, repetition be in like in in programming those sprints or yeah, yeah, for sure. movement i don't know like my another question was like do you ever sub like bike you know oh, what yeah. I mean? you okay get, so piece? so let's start with this what do you what what do you describe as uh, an intensity sprint what does that mean to you just so i so we're talking uh, the same for language. me it would typically be under 60 yards it would be 92 or i guess 90 Ninety to two percent, you yep. know, we just measure, but or higher, yep. and it would be four to six reps around. Um, yep. If I could, I would base it on tenths of a second. So as soon as those guys drop off two tenths, I'd be like, "You're done." Yeah. Um, and then rest as needed, you know, yep. which yep. typically means I have to pump the brakes on these kids because sure. they're ready to go at like thirty seconds. Yes. Yeah, well, because so, they're trying to make it conditioning, right? Yeah. They're, they're seeking that. fatigue versus right. seeking performance. Right. So, yes. I, okay, you're absolutely right. Like, if you're going to do speed for speed's sake, it's got to yes. come first, right? It's the most neurologically demanding. It's got to come first. Um, as far as volume goes, I, I think that was kind of a question that you'd kind of put in there. I'm yeah. a big believer of quality versus quantity, right? I'd rather have five or six really good tens than like 20 really sloppy ones. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big believer. Like I, I can't imagine in a lot of cases where we're over, especially if I'm doing like shorter stuff, like we don't have the capacity to do like a 60, right? Yes. Um, it, in a perfect world, we could maybe run like a couple twenties. So in that case, yeah. we're probably not going to get over 100 to 150 yeah. total meters. Yeah, exactly. is, it, is it possible to mute? Uh, well, usually we keep them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, you can, you can mute her. I'm working on that. Okay. Okay. I don't. I'm obviously not able to do this. I'm not, I'm not this skilled. No worries. I just get a lot of audio. Yes. I thought I could pull it off. Where's Lance? Right? Come on, Lance. <laughs> okay. So coming back to that, if you're going to hit 
Yeah, like I'm going to do maybe 100 to 150 uh, total meters in a linear day. Like, unless, unless I have a space that can allow me to open it up and maybe run a couple like 30s or 40s where we can do some more top end type stuff, we just don't have the space to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, again, for me, it's quality over quantity. I'd rather have, you know, five to six really good 10s or two to three really good 20s and shut it down and not worry about just chasing volume. Because I think if you do that, you know, things just never go the way that you want, right? Right. So, and I love, I love your idea of in a perfect world, if you can time it and do a drop off, that's even better. Um, yeah, it's hard though. So, and, and keep in mind too, I always try and think of, okay, what is my lens? My lens are basketball and soccer players for the most part. So those guys, I can get a lot of uh, speed benefits from the weight room as well. Yep. Right. So versus a, a football guy, you know, they're a little bit more tapped out on what they can get out of the weight room. Um, so I may do a little bit more pure speed work with them. Um, so that kind of covers that on the back end, as far as like, like volume goes, like I tend to mix up the days. Um, if I'm, if I'm trying to get true repeat sprint ability, um, I don't just think of it as repeat sprint ability. I think of it as repeated performance endurance if that makes sense. So for a basketball player, it could be repeat accelerations. It could be repeated jumping. So the, the setup is going to be largely similar there, right? Where I'll start with like a, like a five on kind of 90 off fullish rest and then start cutting into that as the off season goes on. Um, I will say one thing that I'm a big believer in. I don't do a ton of uh, like traditional just body weight sprints. A lot of times if I'm going to do something, I'm going to put them in more of an accelerated position, um, such as a sled sprint or a prowler push, something like that. Even if the load is, is minimal, the last thing I want somebody to do, and I've never had it happen, thank goodness, but the last thing I want somebody to do is like get a little bit too upright and pull a hammy when yep. they're working with me. You yep. know what I mean? So yep. um, I like even just a little bit of forward body lean and I think that's going to sure. work a little bit better for you. Did I answer all your questions? I feel like there were a couple questions in there. Uh, no, you did, man. I mean, I guess like my big one is, so I work with a lot of soccer players, a lot of basketball players and a lot of hockey players. And okay. I've had the hockey players the longest. Yeah. And so what I'm doing with them right now is we're kind of just ramping up the end of our cycle as they lead into their season and yep. we've been kind of playing around with um they're sort of i guess like like similar to the basketball thing like the work capacity and their ability to kind of like keep up that that pace and that change of direction yep and i i read a um, um i was gonna go grab the book i'll grab it but i'm blanking on the name but they were getting like really really jiggy with their like times and yeah and you were like you know like seven seconds on 13 seconds off 12 times with three minutes rest and you do that like seven times and and so right. like when i think about like a basketball or soccer like i just look at how can i you know linear i uh, i progress linear progress their uh work capacity like how does that look i mean you don't obviously start out at like a hundred you know, sideline to sidelines or, right. or do you, I mean, are you, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much you want to share, but like, do you, yeah. is it, is it just like sideline to sideline, you know? And then it's like week two is another rep. Week three is another week four is another, you know, it can be. Um, so generally what you're going to see is there. Okay. So I'll give you some like, kind of like guiding principles and then I'll try and give you some specifics too. Right. So in general, we're always moving general to specific. So like to start an off season off, like I'm just trying to build general quality. So maybe it's um, tempo squats to build a little bit bigger, slow twitch fiber. Maybe we're going to do some explosive work, like a lactic power work just to build a bigger engine. Um, but you're familiar with kind of how I talk about the V, right? If we're thinking of the energy system continuum, if we've got purely a lactic over here, and then purely like extensive aerobic work 
Like those two are kind of compatible, right? And then we just work our way in throughout the course of the off season. So, you know, we're going to start with stuff like that. Um, as we get into more of like a block, or as we get into like a block two, now we're getting into, okay, we're definitely going to do uh, what I would call explosive repeats. Okay, so starting to cut into that, they're not getting full rest anymore. Maybe it's five, six seconds. So we're staying in that alactic zone, but we're starting to cut into their rest periods. Okay, so we're starting to do that. Um, you know, there's probably going to be a, a more extensive day in there. Okay, so like let's say on day one, we're doing a prowler sprint and it's six seconds on and it's week one, it's 60 seconds off. And week two, it's 54. And week three, it's 48, right? So we're just, it's one to 10, it's one to nine, it's one to eight, it's one to seven. So we're tightening it up there, right? So I may have a day like that. And then the second day, maybe more of what I consider just a pure capacity day, okay? So let's say that day, we're gonna go six, six seconds on, 60 seconds off. So it's one to 10. We're gonna do 10 rounds of that. Well, then in week two, we're gonna do 10 rounds and then we're gonna take a five minute break and then we're gonna do five. And then repeat that again. And then on week four, we're going to go same work to rest, six on 60 off, right? But we're going to go 10 rounds, five minute break, 10, 10 rounds. So you see how we're building that endurance? So like we're kind of building on one day, we're building that ability to truly repeat sprint on less and less rest. So you're trying to maintain the power and the output with less and less rest. And on the other day, you're just trying to increase volume over the course of, you know, the next four to six. Yeah, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I'll play around with that. And then the big thing is, and I always think in about three, in, in three blocks in a, in a macro cycle or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that last block is very, it, we're getting close to lactic, if not touching lactic for sure, um, just to expose them to it. But one thing that I, I think is really important here is it has to be more tissue specific, right? And I hate the term sports specific, but it's got to be more, more sports specific in that realm too. So if we're pushing a prowler that month, month three, we're going to do like a lot more change of direction and that sort of thing. So like for my soccer guys, I'll generally have three days. I'll do uh, a 10 yard shuttle day, right? And you got to think a 10 yard shuttle, they should be getting four or five turns. Okay. So more change of direction, more decelerations, more accelerations. Right. And maybe that day is like 10 on 40 off to start. And then we start cutting into that rest period. Another day, may be what I call a long shuttle day. So that's like a 25 yard sprint. And that just works well here in our space. I mean, you can see this is all the turf turf we have, but that day is going to be more of like a, like a high end aerobic power. So it's like say 10 on 20 seconds off or 15 on 15 off. And we may only do six to eight rounds of that because we know by then they're, you know, either at the max of their aerobic power or they're touching on some anaerobic qualities. So, or like yeah. glycolytic qualities. So maybe we'll do eight rounds and we'll take a five minute break and then we'll do four to eight more. Okay. So, that's kind of the way that I'm laying it out over the course of the off season. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like that's the art of it, right? It's like, how do you smooth those transitions? And so yeah. that's, that's where the real money's made. It's like when it's real herky jerky, that's when people start feeling beat up or they start having like little injuries and aches and pains. So I think the smoother you can make you can block and you can smooth those transitions, the better your athletes are is that helpful oh yeah 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 i don't think there's like i don't think there's any one magic work to rest ratio right and look i could prescribe seven on 13 off and it's i have never seen the paper so i'm not gonna but i mean like everybody's gonna respond to that differently right if you've got a team of 10 to one guy, that's like easy to another guy that's like smashing him. And to yep. the guy in the middle, it's like just the right amount of work to rest. So. Right. I mean, to be honest, it, 
it, when I, you know, when I look at it, I'm like, okay, well, I got five lines of offense, five lines of defense. So that's five different work to rest ratios. Uh, you know, defense and offense are going to be different line one through four. And it's just like, right. you get to the right. point where you're like, it's just too much. Um, yeah. But, and, and I've got different expectations. Like you said, you have different expectations, right? So in like right. soccer, I don't expect my center back to be the fittest guy yeah. on the field. Right. Yeah. But he better be strong and powerful and explosive when he needs to be. Right. Yeah. So yeah. like, that's kind of the way you have to think of it is like, especially if you're programming for a big group, um, and even if it's not a big group, you know what I mean? Like even like a group of six to eight, there's going to be yeah. individual differences that you have to deal with. So. What else? It's just, hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Yeah. How, are, you, are you still using the uh, heart rate um, below 60 to figure out where to start? Yeah. You know, and, and I'll be honest, I don't use it as much because most of the guys that I get are pretty fit. But especially if I had younger kids or less developed athletes, I'd be a lot more, a lot more focused on that. Like, and that's one thing legitimately – so you know Ruth because you you have some big boys like some of those guys I think benefit from just some basic extensive work right yeah whether it's whether it's circuits whether it's pushing the pace in the weight room a little bit whatever the case may be I think a little bit of extensive work does a lot for those guys because one of the biggest issues I see is their power's off the charts but they got no capacity right like they can't just they can't repeat it because yeah. I mean like one or two efforts and they're smashed so you need some extensive work up front and then you need to be patient. Like that's one thing with, uh, with Jalen right now, like we started with him. So David, a little context here. He's a defensive tackle, like 280, 285. He's a big dude and pretty fit. But I mean, we started the prowler at five on 90 off and around a six. I mean, he was pretty tired, you know? And so now we're like two or three weeks into a little bit more advanced block. We've been training together like six weeks now. And so now we're at like six on 60 off six on 54 off. And he, he's starting to be able to repeat that explosiveness over seven, eight, nine reps. But I think some of those big guys, they need, you got to be patient with them and you, they need some of that extensive work. So with him, we do like some, some just pure cardiac output. Um, I had him doing some HICT step ups, um, just stuff to, to build some general work capacity, I think is really valuable just to get those guys a little bit fitter. And, you know, quite frankly, they feel so much better. I mean, I think Ruth, you've seen this with your guys, if they're heavy and they're out of shape, like they kind of know they're miserable, but they don't really know until you train them for four to six weeks. And they're like, like, wow, I just feel a lot better. You know, they sleep better. Their body feels better. They recover faster. I didn't, I didn't know because I hadn't seen you do it, I guess, for a while. But I didn't know, uh, you know, like like when the big basketball player came in at one time, he was like 88 right after the season. Oh, yeah. Resting heart rate. Yeah. And, and so he was a perfect example, right? Like he needed extensive work. That's why we literally did six sessions a week. Right. And, you know, two of them – well – I mean, two of them, we finished his weightlifting sessions with HICT. And then the other two were just pure like cardiac output sessions just to drive his resting heart rate down. Cause I mean, he was a big dude, but I mean, he's kind of fat. He's kind of out of shape. I mean, uh, do you remember Roof how, what he told me he'd ate for the last three weeks? Oh yeah. yeah. Creme brulee waffles yeah. every morning for <laughs> breakfast. So uh, that'll that put some good. weight on you pretty quick. That was great. Um, yeah, I just, I didn't know, you know, like with the kids I work with, you know, it's just a matter of getting them just to move around the little kids. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, I, um, the one guy that was talking about the middle school kids, yeah, just getting them to, to move. And know. that's where too, like, I think sometimes we get like too caught up in like overthinking things, yeah. like just get them moving more get them, I, I hate the word training for kids, 
but you know what I mean. Like get them in the gym, get them moving, get them training, work at a reasonable pace. It's amazing how much stuff just kind of shakes out when you just kind of get them started in the, the training process. Can't, so do you think in the beginning with the, say, say you had a middle school kid come in. Yep. You think we don't spend enough time working on cardiac output and capacity and or capacity or the two different things or, um, no, uh, okay. Like cardiac output, you're chasing a specific adaptation, but right. at the end of the day, you're chasing capacity, right? You're chasing work capacity. Right. Um, the hard thing is, it's like in a private setting, it's hard to sell. You know, it's hard to just set up stations and say, okay, here we go. We're going to work on work capacity. I think you have to sneak it into the workout because right. otherwise, I mean, ultimately you're not selling the kid. I mean, you are to an extent, but you're selling the parents. Right. So you have to demonstrate that a kid, little Johnny's faster and stronger and more explosive. So, you know, again, I think just getting them involved in the training process will shake a lot of that out. Now, if a kid's 50 pounds overweight, you know, I think they could benefit from some of that outside of the gym and, and maybe you can have that discussion with them. But I, I think it's really hard to just sell pure work capacity to a young athlete or more importantly, to a young athlete's parents. Not to say that it's not valuable, but as a standalone, it's hard to sell that. You have to kind of package it with the other stuff. Well, but if you have, you know, don't, don't we kind of include that? Isn't that kind of what we do? Yeah. With, I mean, look. Uh, with the, uh, you know, you can do a kettlebell circuit or, you know, just some training where you're alternating exercises, just moving from one to the other. Absolutely. I mean, just, I think this, the structure of our programs in general lend itself to building work capacity, right? Yeah. It's not like at any point in time with a little kid, they're not like so explosive or so neuromuscularly advanced that they need like three minutes rest in between sprints, right? right? So, I mean, just the fact if you're working on generally 45 to 60 seconds rest, you're getting work capacity. I mean, to an extent, it's not maybe purely cardiac output, but you're definitely getting an aerobic adaptation just from keeping them moving for an hour. Yeah. Got it. I got another one for you, Mike. Let's go, man. So in kind of that, uh, so you said something I really liked and maybe if you could just clarify what you mean by it and then I'll ask my question is increased yeah. performance endurance. I mean, is that, are you simply, is that like basically work capacity sort of? Yeah. So, but, so here's how I think of it, right? Like repeat sprintability. If, if we're calling it repeat sprintability, then everybody thinks of, if we're taking it literally, it's repeat sprints, right? right? Versus, you know, the repeated ability to decelerate and accelerate. Sprinting's part of it. So that could be part. Um, what about repeated jumping efforts? That sort of thing. So um, I'm just always trying to think of what are they going to do in their sport? Right. And how can I use my conditioning to better prepare them for it? Yeah, right? I mean, I, so I think that that changes your mindset, right? Because it's not just, hey, can I do this? Let's say a 10 yard dash. It's not just, can I do this for 50 reps or whatever without fatiguing? Like, there's more to every sport than that. It's, can I accelerate and decelerate? Can I jump repetitively when I need to? You know, like right. trying to think more in that, that line. And then if you do that, then it makes kind of your target for where you want your conditioning to be that much easier because I think for a, a while when I started diving into the conditioning stuff, like I just kind of followed like stuff that I could do in the gym, right? Like a prowler push or something of that nature versus, okay, but like, how can I make this again, not sport specific, but more contextual to what they're going to do. So a soccer player, I think the literature says something like they're going to have 14 to 1600 changes of pace in a game that could be speeding up slowing down changing direction so it's like if all i'm doing in the gym to prepare them for sport is just pure sprinting straight ahead i'd say i'm training the energy system but i'm not necessarily training the body for the forces that are going to be involved in their sport or, or exposing sure. them to what they're going to see in their sport okay yeah yeah that, no, i like that a lot um 
So the follow up then, I guess, is, and you kind of, I guess you, you just talked about, uh, you know, well, so for you and what you do, like how big a role does the barbell play in driving that increased performance endurance? So like, just as an example on my end, I have a group right now and I decided to run them through a program where we decreased rest, increased weight and sets over a couple yep. of weeks yeah yep. um as a po because you know i'm in wisconsin so yep um sometimes you just can't run i have about 30 yards indoors you know what i mean so yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean so this is a perfect example of you have constraints on yeah. what you can do right and hockey's tough because w what happens if you don't have a rink right you know cool dog by the way so <laughs> it's, it's like you, you make, you do the best that you can. Okay. So like if I didn't have access to all this and I had to do it in like a thousand square feet, then the barbell would be a lot better tool. And maybe we'd be doing like squat jumps or something like that, you know, for a football player instead of, um, you know, whatever kind of like explosive upper body work we're going to do. Maybe we would just do more like power endurance work with chains or something like that, or a band to try and make it as fast and explosive as we can. So, you know, I think you're absolutely warranted in that. If you don't have the means to do exactly what you want, you make it as good as you can. Right. So, you know, it's something that, you know, luckily I can do most of what I need to in this space. But, man, I would love to, on Wednesdays, have 60 yards to where I could open these guys up and do a couple 40s and expose their hamstrings right. to some top-end speed work. I think there's a lot of merit in that. But right now I don't have it. So I got to hedge my bets. I got to make sure my resets are on point. I got to make sure we're getting eccentric hamstring work in, you know, throughout the program. So I'm trying to hedge my bets in as many other ways as I can. But no, I think you're absolutely spot on, man. If you can't do exactly what you want, try and regress it back and say, okay, well, how can I make this as specific as possible with the tools that I have? Right. Yeah, I mean, do you think it's fair too? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, to be totally honest, I got into this industry a long time ago and, you know, I don't have a formal education, but I've kind of sure. scraped and crawled my way <laughs> through it. And so, you know, like I get a lot of pushback on the weights. Um, How so? Uh, they don't, you know, uh, the most common one is if my kid lifts weights, they're going to get slow. I, you know, uh, yeah. I know just based on physics that that's just not how it works right the right. more force you can produce against the ground yeah you know you should be able to get a little bit faster so, yeah. so uh but you know i just to be able to kind of talk about that stuff to parents in a way where you know because i tend to talk about things a lot of times in like energy systems yeah um and just making that connection you know uh to them between you know how the weights are lift lifted based on yes. you know rep sets rest duration things like that yeah it's very different you know i can make a a squat set uh, i can sort of drive similar adaptations with a squat that i can with the sprint yeah so, right. so they get I think, the, yeah i think that's how you have to pitch it right like one of the things that i do to try and disarm people from that that argument right off the bat is say look you know like we're big believers in proper strength training in our gym. I think it's a huge piece of the puzzle. It can make your kid stronger, faster, more explosive. But the key is how we do it, right? And I yeah. always explain we're very focused on quality. It's not quantity. It's not, definitely not how much you can lift. Because I said at the end of the day, we're not trying to be power lifters. We just use weights as a tool to make a faster and more explosive athlete. So I think sometimes it's don't even let them get that thought out. Like if you express it hey, Mike, first. Can you say that? Yeah. I lost you for a second. Can you just say that one, the part about the tool, use it as a tool because I really yeah. like it. Yeah. So we don't use weights for the sake of just putting more weight on the bar. We use it as a tool to drive power and explosiveness with our athletes. Yeah. yeah. Right? Awesome. So yeah. what I found, and, and this may work for you as well, um, sometimes it's, it's answering the question in their head before they get to say it. 
right? Because sure. then they feel like, okay, this person already understands. Sure, so if sure. you come at them and say, when they hit, tell me about your program and you work that little piece in there, yeah. then it's like, oh, okay. Because what do most people think of? Most people, like they're not wrong. Like if all you do is bang weights yeah. for like four years and you turn into a power lifter, you will get slower. Right. Right. Yeah. It's oh, like yeah. diminishing returns. So they're yep. not wrong, but it's like, you have to cut that off at the pass and be like, look, that's not how we use weights here. Weights are a part of a well-rounded program. It's going to make your kids stronger, healthier, but most importantly, they're going to be, they're going to be more explosive and more powerful as a result. Right. And that's, that's how we use strength training here. It's not to become a world champion power lifter. It's to become a better athlete. Um, yeah. I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth, man. <laughs> yeah. It's I, I say it to the kids all the time. Uh, you know, we, 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 we jokingly, you know, I work with a lot of high school kids and they like to give me shit and we push, we push each other around a bit, but they're, they like to, they like to push my buttons with the like, you know, Oh, it's, we only need skill. We don't need weight room time, you know, kind of right. stuff. Right. And, right. You know, it's, so it's good. It's good to hear that. Cause that's exactly how I feel. And you know, I, it's, you know, you look, I look around sometimes and I see a lot of these places that are, we don't lift weights. We, you know, we focus on agility or we focus on right. power and we're right. like, well, wait, I, I do that too, but I lift weights also. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Good luck. Good luck building power when your cup is this big. Yeah. You know I, what I mean? I agree. Our cup's yeah. this fucking big. So I can't wait till we match up on the ice and I smash yes. your team. hundred percent. Yeah. So I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. So here's, here's another thing that you can think of too, um, that I think it's been a game changer for me because like, I don't train a ton of football guys. Um, but the football guys that I do have, um, I try and again, change their perception of the weight room. Right. And it's, it's a performance tool. It's not, <coughs> it's not a contest of how much can I bench or squat or whatever. So yeah. when I can use a tool like a gym aware or a push band or something that's like VBT, now it changes the lens that they look at this through. Right. So now it's not just, Oh, I benched 365 today. It's, Oh man, I just pushed 315, but it was at like 0.55 meters per second. Yeah, yeah. Right? For sure. So then too, you don't you don't get into this argument of, well, I can go heavier, coach. It's like, no. You can go as heavy as this thing tells you you can go, right? And then you're always working them in the zone that you want anyways. Right. So that's what's been great. Yeah. Sorry. That makes a lot of sense. Sorry about that beautiful technology when I'm getting phone calls while I'm trying to take a phone call. <laughs> what else? Hey, uh, Sylvain, I saw you popped on not to call you out, but if you have a question, do you want to pop on? Or if you just want to hang out, that's totally cool too. But I wanted to give you a shot if you wanted to ask some. Going once, twice, three times. Okay. Hey, Mike. So Dave, Roof, yeah, I got to go run, guys, but uh, Mike, thanks so much, man. This is actually, this is great. <laughs> this Dude, is great. You're doing good stuff, man. Sometimes it's just validating what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it sounds yeah. like you're doing great stuff and you're asking great questions. So I think you're definitely on the right path, man. Appreciate it, man. Thanks My a lot. Pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. Thanks. What kind of dog? Hey, yeah. David, what kind of dog yeah. you got? Uh, the one in the camera was a Norwegian elk hound. I love those dogs. That's how I thought. Yeah, talks. man. I got, a, I got a Chesapeake who's a good dog, too. But the one that you saw was the Norwegian elk hound. So, cool. yeah, he's a good dog. He's a little loud sometimes, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, buddy. Roof, did you have another question? Um, yeah, I could probably think of one. Well, you don't have to think of one. I thought maybe <laughs> you were going to ask something. You know what? No, I, you know, I always got questions. I was I was kind of hoping Sylvain would uh, uh, right in here and uh, uh, see what he had. But um, so what? Where where are you with? I was kind of specific, but where are you with Jalen now? In like in his conditioning? Yeah. So so, so for what, him, what's that look like now? Yep. So I'll give you the first month was. Um, some pure like a lactic power stuff. We did some HICT a couple days. Of, well, we did HICT daily. We did the two lower body days 
uh -huh. with, uh, with the step ups. And then the day in the middle, the Wednesday was with the, uh, explosive prowler push. All right. So that's kind of where we started him. And now I really like, um, the sled pushes for him, like the prowler pushes. So I basically have two different styles of workouts and it's kind of what I was describing earlier. So we've got the one day where it's always five to six seconds. It's really explosive. And then over the course of the month, we're just stripping away rest periods, right? Nice. So it started at like six on 60 off. Week two is six on 54, six on 48, six on 42. So the goal of getting him to be where he can go six on 30 off for say 10 to 12 plays, like, right. and not like just gas out. <laughs> so, right. so we've got that day, which is, I would call a density day. And then the second day, the Wednesday, is more of just like a pure capacity day. So there, he's six on, 60 off. So he's at that one to 10 work to rest ratio. And then we're just trying to add volume each week. So what I don't want to do is go, like with a soccer player, maybe I'd go 10 week one, 12 week two, you know, that kind of thing. Right. With a guy like him, I don't want to do that because there's generally a limit to how many reps he's going to do in a given drive for football, right? Right. So for him, we're generally going to stay at 10, but then we'll do a five minute break and then we'll go a set of five. And then, you know, the, maybe the week after that, we go a set of 10, five minute break, set of 10. So we try and build kind of that work capacity that way. So is that, is that, what does that look like as far as the exercise? Still, it's still a prowler push. Still oh, a prowler push. Yeah. Okay. Cause I think, I mean, that's very contextual to the position he's going to be in. Right. Um, you know, anything – and, again, that's where it comes down to trying to make it at least somewhat specific with regards to the pattern or the posture. So, for him, I love a sled push. I love a tire flip. Anything that kind of gets his hips down, forces him to drive and extend through his hips explosively, you know, I think is going to be beneficial. So. Good. Okay. So, yeah, that's where we're at with him. And it's been pretty cool. Like, the second – like, that first, that first week in this new block is always kind of a shock, right? Because they're used to having, like, more complete rest. Right. And then you go to that six on, 60 off, and they're dying, right? Like, rep seven, eight, they're struggling a little bit. But after you get in, like, two or three weeks, it's amazing. Like, the body starts to figure out what you're throwing at it. And all of a sudden, like today, we did, uh, we did 10 rounds and then a five-minute break, and then we did five more. And it really wasn't until about his fifth rep of the second set that he started to peter out a little bit. So yeah. it's been pretty cool to watch, man. He's definitely getting fitter and fitter as we go. So what, I'm excited, what you, man. What are you doing the other two days then? So the other two days are the, the density days where we chop in or we chop up the rest. So we're just trying to get him, you know, working on less and less rest as we get him closer to camp. So we've still got like six more weeks. Yeah. So again, by the end of this block, he'll be at like six on 42. And then we'll still have four weeks to get him to where he's like six on 30 off pretty repeatedly. And hopefully trying to maintain as much power as he can in between wow. rounds. Okay. Cool. How's your uh, tire – Tire uh, battles going with him. Oh, I'm not tire battling that dude. He would break me. I, I, I was thinking. I was thinking about that. And I don't. I don't really know if that's what he needs. Yeah. No. As a, as a defensive lineman. No. Yeah. No. I think it. I think it's more. It was more beneficial for Drew yeah. being an offensive lineman. Yeah. But yeah. And plus, I'm legitimately. I'm scared. There's no way I was going <laughs> to tire battle that guy. And that's saying something. I battled with Drew. I battled with DeAndre, who was 325. Yeah, that's true. But he was, he was softer. Jalen is a scary human being. I mean, he's banging out at 285 roof. He's banging out sets of seven chin-ups. Wow. I mean, wow. He's, he's an impressive human being. So, Jeez. All right. Hey, Sylvain, I'm going to give you one more shot, bro. If you got a question, hit me up. If not, I'm going to shut this party down because I can see roof and talk to him any day. That's right. <laughs> Plus, it looks like my, my picture froze on the screen, so it's going to be more of an audio call than a video. 
All right. Well, if that's it, then I'm going to call it. Sylvain, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Roof, thank you as always. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, man. All right, my friends. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed uh, the call. And if you have follow-up questions, make sure to just drop them on the uh, Facebook page and I'll do whatever I can to help, okay? That was good. Thanks. Thanks, Roof. See you, buddy. See you, man. Bye.